the program more than 20 months after protests began in Bahrain. The resentment of the Shia majority, ruled by a Sunni royal family, has continued to simmer. Today, Shia worshippers clashed with the police as they tried to attend Friday prayers in the village of Diraz, west of the capital. A teenager on his way to the prayers, Ali Arredi, died after a car hit him and he, as he was being chased by the police. More than 55 people have died and hundreds have been arrested since the uprising against the Sunni-dominated government began in February of 2011. Well, the latest trigger for the protest was a decision to remove the citizenship of 31 Shia activists. One of them, Jawad Farouz, joins us now. He's a former member of the Bahraini parliament. We're also going to be talking to our security correspondent, Frank Gardner, who's traveled regularly, of course, to Bahrain. Frank. Just first, in a nutshell, what's the backstory to this? Well, the backstory is that Bahrain is a deeply divided and polarized place. It's a very unhappy place at the moment. The protests are continuing almost every night in the villages. There is no apparent political progress at all towards power sharing by the Sunni dominated uh, government um, to share more power and wealth with the Shia, uh, the Shia population there. And the, the death toll now is running into dozens. On Monday, two policemen, uh, as you were, sorry, on Monday, two Asian workers were killed. Um, a bomb, bombs went off. Um, I think it's only going to get worse. Unless there is political progress, I cannot see a way out of this. Mr. Farouz, you are disavowed. You are stateless now on paper. What can you do to get your citizenship back? We don't have much options that we have to face that uh, the regime, the way uh, they dealt with the crisis, uh, with the iron fist and try to uh, put more pressure on the oppositions to accept the way they are dealing with the crisis through the very marginal solution for the political solutions. So uh, uh, my case, it was so clear that uh, it was so sudden, shock, I never been uh, even uh, told that they have planned to uh, impose me uh, to, to take uh, or uh, uh, my decision will be taken away from me. So. Uh, Still, I'm consulting to see what's going to happen, but uh, there is no uh, constitutional uh, background for this uh, decision. There is no uh, law which is a part of the citizenship law of 1963 is backing it. Although certain power given to the ruler or the king, but it should be uh, proven. Should we should be given a chance to defend ourselves? Interesting, Frank, a former MP there using the word regime. Is there any inkling, are your sources telling you that that regime is prepared to do anything at all, anything that might defuse this? Parts of it are, but they're losing out, I think, to the hardliners. That's the problem, is that you're not dealing with one single entity. There are parts of the Bahraini monarchy which are prepared to sit down and negotiate with the political opposition. But there are others who are, frankly, dinosaurs and think that they can tough out the Arab Spring and that they don't need to give in on this. It's incredibly uh, ill-advised to strip 31 people of their nationality. I mean, I've been interviewing Jawad Farouz. He was born and bred in Bahrain. His father is a Bahraini national. This is against Article 15 of the UN Convention on Human Rights. You cannot strip somebody of their nationality. So it's, it's a very inflammatory thing which has been condemned by both the State Department and the Foreign Office. Is the situation in your country as tinder dry and therefore potentially as dangerous as we've seen over the past, what, 18 months, two years across the Arab Spring? It is more serious than it's been reflected in the media. Uh, uh, daily uh, demonstrations, daily clashes is there and it is it's escalating. Uh, unfortunately, the government don't want to listen to the all uh, advices from the, the friends uh, that they have to find out a true dialogue with the oppositions and we are demanding so we want a true reform through true dialogue and uh, if we don't start it now tomorrow gonna be a little bit late but let me say that it is not struggle between a minority Sunni and majority Shia it is between the dictatorship the family ruling family and the rest of the people of Bahrain because within the opposition there are Sunnis and Shia and within the supporters of the uh, regime, there are some Shia too. Okay, so this is a multifaceted issue, Frank. I mean, why does the outside world, I hate using that expression, but it, it, it fits, why does the outside world continue to take its eye off this ball? We, we seem preoccupied, not least with Syria, of course. Well, I think a lot of it comes down to the news. Um, you know, a lot of Bahrainis have said to me, why have you abandoned Bahrain? Why have you, the international media, ignored Bahrain? The answer, I think, is partly because the Bahraini government often does, in the past, hasn't let people in. So, for example, during Formula One, they banned news journalists, um, which I think was very ill-advised. 
Um, to be honest, I think the whole Arab Spring thing has got a lot to do with it. Uh, just soon after when Bahrain got really violent in February, March last year, Libya started. And Libya, of course, was absolutely huge. It was a sort of full-scale battle with the front line and jets and, and pickup trucks and etc. It was a more dramatic news story, I'm afraid. Um, it doesn't mean to say it's more important or less important, it just was. Then we've had Syria, and I think that has, both of those conflicts have dominated the news at the expense of Bahrain. Now, the danger here is that somebody like Jawad Farouz here and his brother elected MPs who resigned. These are, this is the moderate end of the opposition. The, you know, he is a world away from the Molotov cocktail throwing people. Gentlemen, we'll have to leave it there. Jawad Farouz and Frank Gardner, thank you both very much.